Hi guys, uh, I've changed the um, streaming settings, so hopefully uh, you will be able to hear me right now. If you can't, let me know. And also I've changed it so that uh, it's more real time between you and I uh, when we are interacting. So um, I'm going to write in there, can you hear me? <laughs> can you hear me? And can you see me? Sorry for the delay. Um, the keys to the lab were not where I expected them to be. Okay, great. Hi, Sakari and Corky. Great to have you here. Um, now, I think what I'm going to start with is a video that I've just dropped into the uh, blog post on Nan Madol. Um, because I think it's relevant to um, uh, to the Namadol, actually not to the Namadol, to the um, uh, Pumapunko presentation. I, how do we say that? Altverland, how do we say that? Okay. So let me find out. I'm going to switch cameras here maybe. No, no, I'm not. I'm going to see if I can get this one. Um, okay. Join the technicians. Hi. <laughs> Actually, I'm not Martin. Uh, I am just a volunteer for the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. My name's Bob. Thank you, Louis. Okay, so let me see if I can pull up this video for you now. Um, Okay, maybe I can, I'm going to cut to this window and I'm going to see if I can add an image into this one. I do. Ah, images and videos. Let's try that. Oh, it's on a memory stick. Silly me. <laughs> I kind of have a lot to do between now and when I come to join you. Um, and then it's curfew, so I get very, very small windows of opportunity. But I think as what I've shared now already is starting to get people's juices flowing, I think very soon people are going to realize a lot of what this technology can do. And there we go. So we have it here. And I will... So does anyone have any questions from the previous couple of presentations. Um, it would be good to hear what you think whilst I'm finding something useful right now. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, where is this? Where is this? Where is this? Mm. I prepared a whole directory. So, I wonder if this will allow me to drag and drop. No, not very helpful. Oh, I don't know why that is. I don't know if you can hear this. Oh, I guess I better explain this. Good heavens. Okay, it's um, September 8th, 2008, and I'm... Okay, I'm just pausing that. I don't know if you can, can you hit, hear the audio that's coming from that video or not, guys. Okay, brilliant. Join the technicians. Okay, so um, I don't know if you recall, but if you go and look at our YouTube channel, let's get myself in the right aspect here. Um, if you go and look at our YouTube channel, um, the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, uh, I went and visited the uh, German lab. Uh, which is an undisclosed location where they were, um, they had bought all of uh, the 2008 uh, Hutchison lab, and uh, I think they'd just finished uh, reconditioning most of the components, having spent the best part of a decade trying to find someone competent enough to do it. Anyway, when I was there, they had some samples there, and it was very clear, um, and this is something that I would have expected, that. Um, 
in the samples, uh, it appeared that the effects were um, n lambda plus a half. So that could be zero uh, uh, wavelength plus a half wavelength. So th this is where you have resonance across a sample. And this is why uh, long samples or spherical samples are very important. If you have a spherical sample, then you can have a, a half lambda with the uh, maximum scalar uh, um, concentration in the center of the sample. Uh, or, you know, so it's basically like having a string and you pluck it. So you get one curve that's like that or one curve that's like that. Or you can have like so. It's, it's, it's the resonant mode of a string, typically. And if you look at the sample where John is, um, he's got a magnet on a string and he's moving it over what was formerly a straight uh, um, stainless steel, i.e. non-magnetic uh, billet that he exposed to his technology in, I think, 2007. And you can see it's eaten away in a classic kind of Hutchison uh, way, which is very similar to what I've showed you with Takaki Matsumoto. And um, on, on that subject, I have an, uh, just, just setting aside on the subject of Takaki Matsumoto, I have something to tell you incredibly special. It'll be a separate video, but you need to look out for it. I think basically a miracle has happened and um, something extremely special is going to happen on this front, but uh, I'll leave you with that for now. Um, basically, uh, uh, if you look at this sample, it has, it's affected in the middle and on the ends. So in my view, this would be a sort of a half lambda wavelength or um, you know, one lambda plus a half or something like that. Um, there are unaffected areas. And this was the same with the samples that I handled when I was in Germany and that they had there. So I'll just continue to play that uh, whilst I get a few more things uh, together here. With this unusual chunk of non-magnetic stainless steel, which is magnetic okay, in the middle. questions at the same time. And only partly. You can see the magnet trying to be drawn to the center here. very strongly magnetized as well as this piece here a little bit okay. not so much there but in the centers of these things see it's highly magnetic we'll try over here it's slightly magnetic but rather interesting how close can I get to this Very okay, magnetic I, can, in the I think you get the idea. That heated. actual video I've now put into this is uh, the remote view stainless. sub stack uh, yeah, on talking about the kind of properties to and it. magnetic anomalies in those. As you can see it's a very heavy, massive bar. So you can go and have a look at that in your own time. Uh, I'm talking right now. <laughs> um, the uh, the uh, video that I was just showing you was John Hutchison talking. Yes, that's John Hutchison. Very, very good. Okay, so um, now when I had my um, realization at the beginning of 2017, it suggested a number of things that were possible with this technology. And on, I think it was, if you go to the, I, I've updated the remote view uh, um, substack for um, uh Let's just check that that's going okay. Okay. I had an issue today, and I'm very sorry, but when I, I updated an article and it, and it published it twice, which is a bit odd, but uh, it did, and so it went a bit wonky. So sorry for those that got an extra email. Um, Okay, so on the 2nd of February 2018, I did a live stream where I took apart the Lion 2 reactor. And it was somewhat similar to this Lion 4 reactor, which I've yet to take apart. So uh, look out for me doing that at some point in the future. Um, I then had another further look at it where I cracked open part of the reactor that appeared to be all fused together. And that uh, revealed some really interesting things. And it was the first time I re was really confronted uh, with the question of uh, is this able, this technology, to uh, liquefy rock. So I'm, I'm going to go and try and, uh, and play. I don't know if you've seen that uh, presentation. 
Um, but let me see what I can do to play something from that. Um, and I'll try and switch this to maybe. Uh, bear with me. <laughs> oh. Thank you very much for those people that have joined the Substack and for those that have supported the project over the years. If you are a subscriber and you want to be put at the end of these videos, do let me know um, because uh, uh, it's really helping me to get better equipment uh, and uh, uh, be able to offer you information faster, which I'm trying to do. Uh, so it's a little bit scrappy, I'm afraid, but that's, that's the way it goes sometimes when you work in that way. So I'm going to try and bring in a desktop area app area it is quite okay oh that's interesting <laughs> right okay I, I should have done that slightly differently this top app window sorry this is going to be messy you can see how many millions of windows i've got now okay i'm going to switch back this is terrible sorry extremely low production values <laughs> Um, I don't even know how to clear it. Okay. Uh, I'll answer some of your questions, <laughs> and then I'll do a reset. Okay, so how did the basalt become coherent and or in phase uh, so that it could be manipulated with pointy things? Um, essentially, you make the coherent matter. I will talk about what I believe is the particular matter that's being cohered a little later down the line but if you go and look at the uh, introductory video for the um, uh, launch of uh, the translation of Alexander Parkamov's book Space Earth Human I think you can probably get the message by following the QR codes there to all of the references that I gave at that time uh, this is not something that's normally something that we interact with but uh, I think um, uh, th this is what's going on um, so it's not actually causing the coherence of the actual uh, basaltic blocks. It's causing uh, the coherence of something else in the environment. And you would want to use this because it ordinarily doesn't uh, interact with um, solid matter in a way that's really perceivable. Um, so essentially what you would do is you would, you would beam down your uh, um, coherent matter uh, and uh, it would uh, aggregate on, on, on the, the blocks here um, and it would be this orientation maybe. And if you really forced it, 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 it would sheath the entire thing with it and if it was locked into place in your, uh, um, your volcanic plug, you would energize it a bit that would go from a, 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 a black evo or a grey evo to a white evo state and that will start eating away at the rock on the boundary and then uh, once it's loop free then you, you could lift it up using um, uh, the fact that it's attached to either some co coherent matter above or you would use the directional uh, um, uh, controllable uh, pseudo monopole type uh, magnetic uh, beams uh, as the uh, Lockheed Martin uh, patent by Boyd M Bushman discusses which I've discussed before and you can go and find that on our um, channel um, and essentially uh, a kind of logical extension of that and you may have seen this is is a, a kind of bowl of magnets uh, called the primer fields and uh, that has a hole at one end but you could put a, a magnetic uh, electromagnetic one end and, and, and adjust the beam strength and th this is how you would lift things up and drop them down and beam me up Scotty type things, um, <laughs> all those kind of things with this technology. So um, the, the, the idea with the pointy things is that exotic vacuum objects will reside in the materials that you've treated with them uh, to some degree uh, indefinitely. So if, if this, uh, this is a Hutchison sample and this has been treated, um, uh, there will be some shadow of the, the, uh, the exotic vacuum objects that were built in here. They could be re-energized and one way they can be re-energized is with similar exotic vacuum objects. Um, and, and because they like to spread themselves around, it's kind of like diffusion, they like to diffuse through. Um, they infect other met metals, so if this was highly charged and I put it on some other aluminium, it will infect the other aluminium. So if you've got a um, basaltic block and you've got a, a, another similar material, uh, but made into a pointy thing, 
then as, as you came close to it, it would kind of even out, just as it even out, evens around this. Um, but you have manipulation of that thing uh, because you're holding on to it um, and so forth. So uh, would CPT vaporize stone? Uh, condensed plasma, I'm not entirely sure what you're meaning by CVT there. Um, okay. I remember, um, wow, it's nodal trans, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, I haven't heard of APEC. Um, Okay, so let me see if I can uh, get a better uh, mix on uh, this layer. Desktop, app window. Okay, I think I've got a better solution here. So I'll cut to that. And perhaps I can drop that over here somehow. Unlock that. Go over there. And I can maybe add me in here. <laughs> oh dear, this is terrible. So what I intend to do is find enough time to set up a, a series of windows uh, so that uh, everything's uh, running very smoothly. But uh, this isn't that at the moment, so I just, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, I'm going to go for... This one, okay, all right, so. Uh, so the video I'm talking about, um, or the thing that I want to discuss here is, um, does this thing that you see here explain the geopolymer casting techniques possibly used in ancient megalithic structures? Now, shortly, uh, in around January uh, 2018, when I'd come to my realization that I um, put into a pro presentation called O-Day, I actually saw this video that uh, Camilla Urbani, Urbina sent me uh, again today and it's talking about uh, ceramics, uh, a kind of ceramic techniques where you are melting rock and it refers to some um, English fortresses where one uh, person hypothesized that it burnt down, it was like a, a, a brick wall with um, a, a basaltic wall with, with a wooden structure on above and that kind of burnt down and it caused melting of the rock. And uh, so th that's not inconceivable, it's not inconceivable. And in fact, um, uh, I, I, have, I have considered that. However, um, uh, we know from John Hutchison that um, he had some metal samples where uh, an, a piece of iron, so for instance, this is aluminium, and uh, this is a piece of uh, uh, steel. So he had like a stainless steel knife uh, or, and, or spoon or something. And it, it sank all the way into the center of the aluminium. And I'm going to explain, in my view, how that occurs and how you can get a similar phenomena. Um, and he also had wood go into the center. And I'm going to, hopefully, uh, before curfew, explain how that occurs, in my view, and why this would enable... Uh, geopolymers to be made uh, um, and still have wood embedded into them or other artifacts embed embedded into them which like seem out of place. Now I have shared on our channel before and discussed it where the the wood uh, is not even slightly burnt and this is a feature of this technology and it enables you to do things which are not possible in any other way. So for instance, where, where we are looking at these structures here, so I, 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 I'm going to step back, I'm going to step back because I want to get this kind of in order. Uh, so in, in this particular reactor here, which is the Lion 2 reactor, and, and it essentially looks like this, you have a, a, a fused quartz here and you have a, a kind of a, a lumina or site mullite uh, tube here and this is foamed alumina so i just want to go through um it, i don't know if you've seen the video um but essentially uh, what you have is a number of materials and when i saw this i i almost couldn't believe what i was looking at and and the the reason is is you need to hold these things in mind uh 
And let me see if I can make this uh, document here that I have as a PDF. Um, and then I will share it with you. Okay. Um, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Now, I, I could spend a lot of time making a very, very succinct presentation. Sort of, if I had more time, I'd write you a short letter um, type thing. But um, it is a case now that I've said certain things that uh, people will very quickly realize uh, many other things. And that's just fantastic. And I just want to help um, push that process forward because uh, we really need to start um, exploring these technologies outside of those that... Um, would rather than we don't. Um, uh, so, file, export as PDF. So. Okay. So I'm gonna play the video here in the background. So, uh, whilst I'm organizing what I'm doing here. Hi, Odwenex. Uh, hi, Batika Da Vinci. <laughs> Very nice comment, <laughs> kind of. Um, Okay, so what you're seeing in this video here is I am looking at the Lion 2 reactor and you, what you're looking at through that gap there is I'm shining a light through the back and you can see this smooth kind of like surface, glassy kind of a smooth finish to what was formerly uh, where there used to be some silicon, uh, uh, fused silicon dioxide like this and some alumina. And what has disappeared in that location is some copper and it has, uh, uh, and also um, the actual quartz has disappeared. But you have a situation where the Cantal hasn't. And why is that relevant? Well, I, I'm going to tell you why I think it's relevant. Because if you look at the melting points of these various materials, uh, I think you'll find that Cantal melts at about 1400 to 1500 degrees centigrade. Uh, the uh, quartz melts at around about um, uh, nearly 1700 degrees centigrade. And it's, I think, 2085 2, degrees centigrade where the uh, alumina melts at. Now, these are, uh, as far as I understand it, pure materials. And th the question is, why is that melting the quartz, the silicon dioxide, and the alumina, when the Cantal, which has got a supposedly a lower melting point, hasn't actually melted. Uh, what is going on that's enabling that to occur? And so uh, that is the question that when I looked at this, um, how, how is that occurring? And uh, I'm going to pause that now, because what have I talked about? Well, I've talked about several elements there. And what I've added here to the blog on, on uh, remoteview.substack.com 
is the elemental uh, elements, uh, the, the abundance of elements in the Earth's crust. And I've talked about this in many of my other presentations. Um, and and it, this is very, very important because it's actually telling you what nature wants to do. You don't have to fight nature. And so um, if, if you look at what is the most abundant element in the Earth's crust, it's oxygen. Well, you have oxygen in aluminium oxide, Al2O3, and you have it in silicon dioxide. Quartz, you have it in both of the materials you have here. Um, silicon is the second most abundant, um, and that is 28.2%. Aluminium, everyone worries about the, the uh, environmental impact because it takes a lot to get aluminium oxide into aluminium. However, it's uh, the third most abundant element in the Earth's crust. And interestingly, it's 100% fermionic, so it's a single isotope. And this, I believe, and I've said this before, is why I believe it's one of the elements that uh, was most easy to manipulate with the Hutchison effect because it has a high conductivity, it's the fourth most conductive element, and it has a relatively low melting point. But this is the point, the melting point isn't um, so much necessarily a, thermionic, a thermal effect uh, in this case, it is uh, an effect of the ability of the electrons to hold on to their bonds uh, between adjacent atoms. And uh, if you can manipulate that, um, you are, uh, uh, you, you've got a much better chance of turning aluminium to uh, you know, uh, a kind of liquid, but it's not. It's, it's, um, it's just in a jelly or, or moldable form. And then the fourth most abundant element is iron at 5.63%, and then you go down the list there. Interestingly enough, also, um, many of these elements are predominantly one isotope. Some are 100% like sodium, some, some are, uh, in fact, most of them are over 90% with the ex exception of um, uh, potassium. And potassium is actually extremely important, specifically potassium-40. And I'll come on to that, why I believe that's important. Uh, I came to the conclusion independently, but uh, in Alexander Parkmore's book, he has it right in there. And, and that was, it was just like, oh, God. Everyone gets, when you understand the technology, um, you come to the same conclusions. Uh, and it's only a matter of time and, and persistence. So the, um, if you look at the proportion of elements in the crust uh, um, for the top three, four, and five, and eight uh, elements, if you just look at, at oxygen, silicon, and aluminium, that constitutes 82.53% of every single atom in the Earth's crust. If you throw in iron as well, you get to 88.16%. Now, what have I told you? Um, we had a situation in this reactor here where the uh, alumina here, this, this uh, al 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 aluminium oxide tube, which may have some malate, but I think it's mostly aluminium oxide, and this uh, al alumina, foamed alumina here, have basically been liquidized. In fact, uh, what you're seeing here, the scallop section, I believe, are a macro evo that just eat, ate it out. You can see one that ate it out something here, one that ate out something here, and they are beautifully curved, and they're, they're, they're like just cut off. Uh, and we've seen this in other areas as well. But anyway, uh, that aside, um, uh, what you have is Cantal. Now, Cantal is, is iron and so forth. And it, it, it has some aluminium in it there as well. But that normally comes to the surface as aluminium oxide. And that stops it from oxidizing. However, um, it, it has magnetic elements in there. And therefore, uh, a, 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 the exotic vacuum objects are always magnetic, so they can bind to the surface. And typically what happens with iron, if, if you can't get it going into the surface, uh, in, into the center, it's like our prismatic basalt columns. They go on the outside of, of the material, and they, they do something necessarily on the outside, but if there's easier food on, in the environment around it, it's going to probably work with that first. And so you can see, and in fact, uh, on the cathodes, uh, sorry, the anodes that we're running in the Vega experiments, you can see that the iron seems to perform better, or iron-containing uh, materials. So these are these are things that have uh, uh, ferromagnetic materials in there, um, and and so forth. But anyway, uh, I need to show you some images uh, of uh, the aspects of the uh, reactor, the actual um, uh, the. Uh, lion reactor because it's very very important to
talk through some things here. So let me see if I can do that for you. See, before I do that, and this is, sorry, this is disjointed, but I'm, I'm trying to do my best here. So um, if you look at the uh, um, uh, Puma Punku uh, blocks, um, we said that you could cut them, and this is absolutely true. You can have uh, these coherent matter wave beams, and, and they can cut through material. But um, you also have the capability with this technology, depending on what you have in there, to uh, turn it into a liquid. And, and uh, actually, andesite, uh, it can erupt from about 900 to 1,100 degrees C. And in fact, the um, Lion reactor achieved uh, 1,000 and about 50 degrees C peak, um, which is not the melting point of the copper. It's not the melting point of copper oxides. It's not the melting point of the uh, basically anything in there. However, you could have a situation where uh, something lowers the melting point. And so you could add a flux to it. Now, what would those fluxes be? In fact, what is a flux um, in, in this instance? Um, well, uh, in terms of rock and ceramics, I actually have had some experience. So this is something that I made uh, when I was 15 years old, and it's made out of clay. And you bake this in an oven, and you put a glaze on the outside, and you end up with something shiny. So you can imagine that this was, um, uh, you know, maybe fired rock, as it were. But some of these structures are very, very big and, and very, very precise. And if you had a technology that we know you can do with, say, aluminium, because it was done by John Hutchison, it was done uh, by Ralph Ring, uh, or he witnessed it, it was done in the Soviet energetics program, and there are testimonies of ha this happening uh, precisely the same thing with ball lightning. So uh, in terms of the example that he gave the other day, where the ball lightning touched the metal frame of a window on a train and the guy was able to manipulate it with his fingers um, for uh, 20 minutes. And this was similar to uh, John Hutchison's experience where there was a block of aluminium and um, his colleague came along and picked it up and he left his fingerprint in there and smeared the aluminium. And I've shared those, uh, the images of that before. But anyway, the, the point being is that... Um, uh, if, if you had a technology where you could mold these things, then you could actually shutter the, or, or build the, the molds out of wood. And we know that we can get wood to go into aluminium, okay, uh, because that happened with John Hutchison. Uh, and so um, you could actually uh, create very, very precise molds out of wood, much, much easier. You could very car carve extremely flat, beautifully smooth surfaces, and then you turn your rock, uh, rather, th rather than the thermal heating that you're seeing here that happens in a, a, this sort of volcano uh, between 900 and 1,100 degrees C, you're turning that uh, into a, a, a moldable kind of jelly stuff. It doesn't necessarily have to be a liquid. It just has to be pliable. So um, you, when, you, when you're looking at these uh, um, these. Peruvian blocks here with these holes at the bottom, you could imagine that you would put this, you, you'd maybe have um, some papyrus if you were doing this in Egypt, or you'd have some paper or some kind of insulator to prevent the exotic vacuum objects from uh, infecting the surrounding blocks. So you, you would put that as a boundary, maybe, or you could put it into a, like a leather bag, and it, that might account for the puffy nature that you're seeing here. So you, a fine, fine leather bag, and then what you do is you get this stuff and, and then you would just like push it, push it and push it, push it down. And it would be kind of, I, I imagine it would be something a bit like um, uh, uh, silly putty, kind of like that. You know, it, it would snap if you pulled it hard. It, um, uh, it would be like a kinetic material. <laughs> But it, you could push it and push it in, and, and perhaps if this was what was being used and it had a kind of a jelly-like nature like uh, John Hutchison kind of observed, um, perhaps um, it, it had to be pushed until it squeezed out of the ports at the bottom so you, you know you've got it completely everywhere down the bottom and maybe you would have a, a, a stick that you would kind of jiggle around in there to, to, to fill it up. Uh, and, and then you would kind of like take off the le leather bag. And what you could do actually is you could get to a point where the, the, um, the whole thing was formed. It's almost completely set. And then you kind of just lever it up, yank out the, the leather sack, 
you know, you, you cut a bit from the back, cut a bit from the front, and just pull out the bits, and it's, it's basically exactly what it needs to be, and the remaining bit of gelatinous, gelatinous nature would tend towards the boundary, and it would uh, then bind the, the bits together and produce a very, very tight seal, as it does with the uh, steel that's going in um, to the aluminium in Hutchison sample, and also the, the wood. And the reason this occurs, and I'm, I, ha I have a, a whole sequence of images that I can go through to explain what's happening down at, at, at the metal surface or the crystal grain boundary level to explain this. Um, so yeah, the bag removal is not really a problem because you've got to imagine that the most fluid area of the entire large crystal, effectively, that you've put into place is, is, is the boundary, and, and it would slip. You, so you could actually pull it out, okay? <laughs> So, um, yeah, the flux. So, I, I wanted to talk about the flux. So, um, uh, and, and that is, I've got all the images to explain this. In the case of what you are seeing here, I believe that copper was the flux. Um, and uh, I, we know 100%, with absolute certainty, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that the copper was replete with exotic vacuum objects. We know this because we observed many structures under the microscope of exotic vacuum objects in various different levels of, of, of um, uh, self-organization in exactly the same kind of ways as was observed by Winston Bostick uh, from 1949 through to the late 60s and maybe even the early 70s. And so we know we have the copper which has the exotic vacuum objects. I'm going to show you where these then would bore through the um, the quartz, and I've, sh I've shown bore channels, and I've also shown very large macro objects which are literally churning their way through, and the structures are identical in form to the uh, uh, magnetohydrodynamic structures observed in the quantum coherent uh, reactor by Solin that was uh, applied for in 1992 and awarded in 1997. And you can go and see that Solin pattern. I've discussed it, I think, in, in my uh, latest Russian presentation. But absolutely identical, overlapping uh, um, structures. And they're boring their way through the quartz. And so it, it, the, the, uh, uh, the macro evo uh, the, the, the micro evos are formed in the core of the, the lion reactor, which is kind of in the center here. They actually build up, in my understanding, on the iron, and then the iron goes from uh, um, uh, magnetic, it loses it, goes through its Curie point, loses its magnetic uh, Curie point, and then it releases the evos. They go to the copper. Copper is diamagnetic. Now, the reason copper was put into the lion reactors was just to, as a, a thermal bridge um, and something to fill the gap between the, the, the reactor itself and the quartz liner. But the lion author was not to know that copper was diamagnetic, so it's effectively a reflector. Um, but if the evos get so big, because it's also a conductor, they can go in and conduct through the metal and aggregate in there. And because it's so conductive, exotic vacuum objects do not like to go across a boundary of an impedance change. And the copper is basically the most conductive thing in the reactor. And so they build up and they build up and they build up in that copper and they start churning it around. And then it gets to the point where they can then start forming these very macro structures that churn through the quartz, churn through the... Uh, um, uh, the alumina and effectively create something that's not too far from the geopolymer that would be used in, in the androcyte. But in, set, in the case of androcyte, uh, let's get uh, androcyte, um, it doesn't have copper in there. But uh, if you look at the uh, ratios here, it has 52 to 63 percent weight of silica, SiO2, um, 0.7 to over 2.5 percent of potassium oxide and 16% of aluminium oxide. So it has 16% of exactly this, and it has up to 63% of exactly this. And um, so it, it has many of the same things that we've actually demonstrated uh, are able to uh, move around. So you are creating the little machines inside the core of the reactor. You are then releasing them into an accumulator, which is the copper, which becomes the flux. Now, in the case of the, the, this kind of rock, 
What you could do is if you had unsuitable rock, you could take magnetite, uh, which is a naturally occurring magnetic material, and you could crush that up. You could mix that with silicon dioxide or aluminium dioxide, bauxite, uh, quartz, sand, sand, bauxite, and uh, some, some magnetite. And we know, we know that it will... The, the exotic vacuum objects will congregate around the crystal grains, exactly as Matsumoto established extremely clearly. Um, and, and here, it, 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 it aggregates around the crystal grains. So you can see it, around, eating away at the crystal grains. And so what you do is you put in there a load of magnetite, and you mix this whole thing up, you charge it up, and it becomes a, a kind of moldable rock ready to set. And you just put it in your bag or in your shuttered structure or into your mold, and you let it set. And that's it. But of course, when you want to move it, you need to use your anti-gravity. Um, but so, so it's kind of like you, you're using the same technology that you used in Nanmadol. You're using exactly the same technology family, but you're choosing to use it uh, uh, to make use of the material that, that is available in your local environment um, and so on. So uh, what I'm going to... Um, so, so let me see if you've got questions here. And then, uh, then I want to walk you through the imagery that I have, which will basically 100% uh, show this. And, and as I said, when I, when I first talked about this uh, presentation, I, I said... <laughs> This is going to probably be one of the most important experiments. And I didn't give it a date. I didn't give it an epoch. I just said it is. It's so simple. And at the time, I had no idea that this replicated in more beautiful detail most of the things observed by Matsumoto and most of the things observed by Solin and so many other researchers and, and also John Hutchison as well. And it's relatively cheap. Um, you just had to bother looking. <laughs> you just had to see what was going on. Okay, so, uh, yeah, you, you might get pockets, you might get holes. Uh, yeah, you could slide blocks on molten surfaces, but it's, when I say molten, you need to maybe use a different word. It, it's kind of jellyfied or liquefied. Um, it, it's able to slip, basically. Um, do Evos exist everywhere? Absolutely, 100%, they exist everywhere and uh, if you look at what uh, uh, the black evo or the string vortex soliton that uh, alexander shishkin uh, and his colleagues have been researching for the best part of uh, 11 years now at uh, dubna science city where they did all the super heavy elements um this is north of moscow uh, they established that it was like a condensed uh, form of cold neutrinos and cold neutrinos are ubiquitous in the universe uh, they are so ubiquitous that they form a coherent uh, uh, matter through the entire universe uh, uh, one big coherent matter and they rain down on our planet from the cosmos and they're gravitationally lensed and these things effectively form what are called axions and axions if you blow them up with an intense magnetic field well you know what you get you get X-rays and UV light. So um, that is a huge reveal I've just given you there. <laughs> it's very important. But anyway, um, uh, they are everywhere and you they are always magnetic and they can uh, be influenced and co collected in various ways. I've already told you one way you can collect it in water, but specifically there's something in the water that you can collect it. And that is listed in the uh, paper from 2006 by... Uh, uh, um, uh, Rutskev et al. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's oxygen, and I will do a separate presentation on that. And that makes oxygen an extremely special element in all of this process, and I, I will detail that. But I've got so much to basically prove the case here that I've, I've gathered uh, in the last few hours out of my uh, catalogue here. So, um, yeah, so it's basically lava. It's, it's kind of like lava. Except it's not hot lava that's going to burn you. Uh, it's lava like, like the jelly aluminium of Hutchison. It's turning the material uh, into a, a pliable, malleable, like silly putty essentially, but silly putty that when the, the exotic vacuum object drain to ground or diffuse through moist air or you throw a bucket of water over it to encourage it to set 
as it were. You're not cooling it down, you're de-evoing it. Um, you are able to... Uh, ozone, uh, not so much. It is, it's because of the nature of oxygen and oxygen dissolved into water. And uh, um, this is so important to many uh, exotic vacuum object technologies. And I will walk through how it plays a role in many things. But as I've shown you here, um, uh, oxygen is by far the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. And it's 20% of the air we breathe. It is, it is a miracle atom, it really is. It's quad alpha. Uh, it's, it's so special, it's so special to many of these processes. Um, Dievo, yeah, okay, so. Um, uh, okay, th thank, thanks Hope the, for the kind words. Um, it, honestly, uh, m much of this information um, has just come to me. This is the case for a number of the people that I've met. Um, and so I don't have a right to hold this back. This is, this is everyone's. We were using this technology in the past. Um, it, it is part of the universe and it is a crime that uh, this has been with, withheld from people. But um, anyway, um, so uh, the number of it is you are effectively liquefying rock. Now, I'm going to run through several images. Let's, so just bear with me, ask some questions, and I will try and get this directory so that I can show it to you. Yeah. I've been using a phrase, Corky, um, for a good number of years, and it is, how did we get so stupid? Um, it, th this technology has literally been set in stone, set in stone. And when I use that phrase, I mean exactly how this technology works is in the archaeological record all over the planet. You just have to have eyes to see it. And you will know exactly that that is the truth soon. <laughs> you can go and look, but and you will realize you will have your O day. You will have your O day because you will see that this is the way it is. How did we get so stupid? Right, I have this directory, and I just hope that I can do this in some logical way. Is there going to be any way I can do this that's going to work? Um, like I say, the, the nubs for me are most likely a, a, a kind of draining point. You kind of like, uh, you, you kind of have a leather sack and you have two little ports in the corners at the bottom. And you kind of like push this stuff down and because it's kind of slightly springy and jelly like like you see in Hutchison samples you kind of like have to force it into the corners until it comes to squeeze you could even like vacuum it so it's vacuuming the air out and it's pulling the rock in um ken shoulders i think it was in 2006 said that uh, the egyptians had all of the technology to make exotic vacuum objects you need basically uh, beeswax and uh, copper and uh, that's what he said in, in in one of his published little papers and of course you had the baghdad battery from about five thousand years ago so um right let me see if i can do something like this all right put that up there i wonder if this is going to work Right. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I'm going to try and switch this to this other uh, desktop. <laughs> when you have a million windows and you only want one okay i'm going to do something that probably is going to cause me a problem but um i'm going to 
do an, an app area on an area on the screen. Um, so let me minimize that for the minute. Like I say, thank you for the people that have supported me. It has got enabled me to buy better software. I just need to get uh, a better understanding of how to use it. Um, okay. Why does that not give me a DM? <laughs> My worst presentation ever. <laughs> Custom area. Let me do that. See what I can do with that. Uh, no. Okay, that's not that. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> I've lost the screen now. Okay, sorry, I've lost the screen, so I don't even know where you guys are. Uh, no, what's happened? I can't, e I can't even see you now. Okay, all right, something happened. Okay, oh dear, terrible. Please. Okay. Um, you just want an experiment that can generate tufts. We aren't going to share the uh, kind of like basic layout for Vega experiments. Um, it is extremely, extremely um, uh, simple, but there is a high danger involved because you are using high voltages and relatively high current so there is an issue with that so um, we need to think think about that um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna close some things which are in the way so that I have less windows um, and maybe that will enable me to not make a big zero of what I'm doing here anyway it's nice to be able to chat with you a little bit more freely okay let, let me do this first because um this will be easier okay so talking about the liquefaction of rock i'm going to uh okay i need not that okay so this is charge clusters in action um by ken shoulders and uh, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because uh, it, it, it has some quite good images of the impact of EVOs. So you can see uh, here, these are EVOs boring through um, some thick aluminium oxide. So this is it showing that it can bore through and chop up aluminium oxide. What you're seeing here is that it is going through aluminium foil and again this is the other side of the aluminium foil um, down here you can see evo boreholes and uh, on the uh, bottom right here this is lead glass so this is uh, silicon dioxide or maybe some other glass uh, in here but you can see how incredibly smooth this is now the interesting thing is that he did these experiments where he covered the material that he was firing the Evo through with paraffin wax. And paraffin wax like melts at like 53 degrees centigrade. It doesn't even burn you, okay? Yet it's able to turn materials like glass to something that flows and forms a glassy deposit. Uh, this is, um, yeah, so down here, the, again, this is lead glass down the bottom here. And this is aluminium oxide. And again, you can see the sloshing around the surface. It produces this smooth uh, uh, surface on it. So the idea that this cannot turn uh, rocks 
uh, to liquid is just patently absurd. Um, yeah, so I think I think this may have been the one. One of these, uh, I think, if you look at this paper, it's called um, "Charge Clusters in Action." And I think what it's saying here is, I think this might have been the one where they had aluminium oxide and he put, be well, not beeswax, but paraffin wax on the, uh, yeah, it's actually got a discussion here, I think, yeah. It says aluminium oxide, where is it? Maybe I can find the registrations off on my mouse. Aluminium oxide has a melting point of 2000, it was 2070, but anyway, let's call it 2050 degrees centigrade, maybe it is that. Um, and yet, it has not raised the temperature of the thin substrate material in any perceptible way. Even a thin coating of low temperature wax on the surface uh, to serve as a temperature indicator remains undisturbed unless the aluminium oxide directly contacts it. Additionally, the surface tension of the aluminium oxide fluid is so low that it runs out to almost an atomically thin edge and there is no indication of evaporation of aluminium oxide onto immediately adjacent surfaces. This behaviour is contrary to what ha would happen when a molten particle of aluminium oxide from a thermal melt strikes the surface. Under this condition, even a particle of a few microns in diameter partly melts into the aluminium foil, uh, has a high contact angle and also evaporates a decoration of aluminium oxide on the immediately surrounding surface. So there you have it. Uh, you can have a glassy like uh, uh, ejection uh, and you can have this spreading out and it's under wax which melts at like 53 degrees centigrade or something. So the idea that you could put things in thin leather bags or you could mask them off with paper um, things like this uh, is completely conceivable with technology. Uh, Gordon Doherty, I actually think we got so stupid because of the flood. The Ice Age. One of the two, or both. <laughs> um, I, I think that the knowledge keepers kept it to, within such a small number of people that the people that went, oh, you're a god because you can move mountains around and you can build these huge buildings and fly around and stuff. Um, they kept it to themselves. And, and so maybe they just went somewhere else or, you know, they, they died because the thing was such a sudden event. Or maybe it was a war between rivaling factions. And, and so you, you had a destruction of the technology in the process of trying to gain the upper hand. Probably something stupid like that. Okay, so um, I have so many images that I, I want to show you here. Um, I've included this reference from Taylor from 1969, which talks about the, it's not, not, not from Bolivia, but it talks about uh, andesite and the concentrations in there. Now, why is potassium uh, important? Well, I think 0.02% of potassium uh, is um, uh, potassium um, 40. And why that is important is because potassium-40, uh, it has three decay modes. But the decay mode we're interesting, interested in is the beta minus, the, the, the uh, high-speed electron that comes out of it. And this comes out at up to 1.331 mega electron volts. And that is extremely energetic. So if you have andesite, uh, which is not very good for this, it has 0.7% potassium uh, K2O in it, that's probably not the andesite you would want to use. You'd want to find a source of andesite that had the 2.5% in. Now why? Well, exotic vacuum objects, uh, as I said earlier, in their black mode, it would appear that they are condensed solitons of uh, uh, cold neutrinos. And cold neutrinos interacting with a beta isotope of which potassium-40, which is 0.02% or whatever, of natural potassium, is the second most unstable isotope in the universe after uranium-235. And I think it's point uranium-235 has a half-life of 0.3, uh, 0.3 of the age of so-called so age of the universe. And, and uh, I think uh, potassium-40, next in line, has 0.9 
uh, uh, times the length of the universe for its, its half-life. So we're assuming that's true, uh, we're about halfway through the potassium that is in the universe. So it's not going to be a problem running out, it's everywhere. And uh, as I said uh, uh, previously, it's uh, one of the top eight most abundant elements uh, in the Earth's crust. So it's not a problem. It's in your body all the time. And that is one of the issues why these things can have a danger for you. But anyway, if you, have, uh, you choose your andesite, which has a higher proportion of potassium, when you fire uh, 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 exotic um, uh, vacuum objects uh, in there, and they either generate through the um, collision of ions and electrons cold neutrinos as is discussed and shown in uh, Alexander uh, Parkamore's book Space Earth Human um, these uh, will feed the exotic vacuum object so if you you want to be more effective with this technology you would choose andesite that has a higher proportion of uh, potassium oxide in there and so that's why that's very very important Okay, so are we still up? <laughs> right, so I, I have to find a way to get this uh, operational. So let me see what I can do. Um, uh, let me close down some windows. I don't need that anymore. Right, I'm past curfew now already, so. Wish me luck. <laughs> Do I need that? I don't think I need that. I don't need that. Potassium is also created by chickens using biological transmutation. Actually, uh, it's potassium goes to calcium. <laughs> you, you, you. The, the chickens eat calcium in their cells. So, uh, why do you create these videos so late? That you, because I, I have a family and I have family duties. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, was if someone was asking about the the anti gravity properties, um, uh, Ken Shoulders, if you go and look at the the only interview with him that I transcribed that was recorded between him and, and John Hutchison uh, and Nancy Lazeri and John's wife in two thousand and ten. In fact, Nan Nancy was filming it. Um, uh, he says that in the extended part, which I did a separate transcript for that uh, in, inside an exotic vacuum object you can um, uh, nullify charge, inertia and mass. And I've already described that when I was with uh, Dr. George Eagley in, in Hungary in the, uh, October 2016, that he described, it, or, or maybe it was in 2017 when I was with him in India. But anyway, uh, there's a number of uh, um, uh, uh, testimonies that he had, which I think you can go and get them uh, on his public website. Um, they were classified, I think, by the Navy at one point, but anyway, um, they're, they're, they're available. And I think one of them was where there was a ball that was floating around and the person said that uh, uh, a load of sand came out. And another one uh, said that a ball lightning was floating around, as they do. They tend not to like to go straight to ground, they kind of hover, hover around above the ground to a certain degree, um, buffeted, and they kind of like move along walls but don't touch them. And this is actually what you observe with m micro uh, exotic vacuum objects. They can move down uh, a, a guide channel of, of uh, 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 say, an alumina trench. They'll move down. They don't touch it um, if it's the right dimensions. So anyway, um, uh, this particular uh, uh, testimony it had water coming out. Now, that tells you two things. One, if you put... A, I think they said gallons of water. So if there's two gallons of water, you've got like at least four litres, maybe, uh, sorry, at least eight litres, but maybe nine litres of water. If you put nine litres in the air, it's going to fall straight to the ground, isn't it? And if you put a bag of sand in the air and let go, it's going to fall to the ground. So uh, you know that um, uh, in both of these instances that the, the mass uh, was being, uh, or the effect of gravity, or the thing that causes things to fall to ground from the, the amount of mass in there, uh, uh, was negated. 
And we know that ball lightning can go through windows, it can go through aluminium plane shell uh, and go down the, the, the corridor in a plane. So this, this shows that it, it, in dark mode it can lose its charge, which means if it's containing sand or water or frogs or whatever and, and it goes through, it means it's able to effectively walk through walls and carry the material that's shielded because all of the charge of the material inside is shielded. And it also means that the water's not boiling, so it's not over 100 degrees C. So um, even though you might think it's a plasma, the, the, the plasma is because um, it's interacting with the material around it. If ball lightning goes into water, it will boil the water. But the bit inside might not be hot, <laughs> but it can produce hundreds of kilowatts uh, of su supposed boiling of water. And this is because the, the water is going into the coherent matter area and the coherent matter is interacting with it. It's maybe transmuting it, it's maybe condensing it down, releasing the energy from that condensation and coherence process. And that's producing energy, but inside it's maybe not even changed whatsoever. And, and so you have a zone on the outside, on, on the boundary and inside. And when the, the, the material is interacting with that coherent matter, it produces light in a wide range of frequencies, but a lot of, a lot of UV, some X-rays, and also it produces, in, in certain instances, heat. And so uh, you get these uh, various effects going on. And if you, if you have UV and X-rays coming out, that will ionize the air around it, and so you get a white EVO. Um, it's because of the condensation of the matter, it's emitting these uh, photons and high-energy beta particles as well. Um, it's ionizing the air around it, and they typically have various colors of glowing, but often blue, <laughs> really. Um, yeah, beam me up, Scotty, is real. You, you, you basically, you, you, you know where your, your target is. You, you beam down, put a coherent matter around them, and then you, you directionally, magnetically pull them up, or you pull them up with the beam itself. And they can walk through your ship <laughs> into your place and then you remove the coherent matter from around them. That's fine. Um, uh, when, when I first realized this in, in 2017, and by the end of 2017 I had pretty much all of the proof, um, it, it, it was quite a traumatic experience because I kind of like, I kind of had to say these things which are going to be very, very difficult for people to understand. but. The facts are there on the ground. Um, you know, the facts exist in physical experiments, and and you know, people, companies like Lockheed Martin are actually selling the technology now. So, you know, I don't, I don't think it should be there preserved. I think this is something that we, we should as a species benefit from, uh, um, because I mean, it makes a complete. I said in uh, 2017, I said there's probably not going to be any. There's probably going to be no one with money that won't hate me. <laughs> at the end of this process because you know the transportation industry the look if, if I was someone that wanted to roll out this technology I would be someone that would have electric cars rockets that do VTOL and boring technology because you can bore straight through rock with this extremely extremely quickly but I'd want to set up those kind of technology families that I was supposedly researching uh, so that, oh, I've had this amazing invention. I've just come up with this incredible technology that allows us to take off and land and go to Mars or whatever. Or I have this incredible mining technology. Or I have this incredible technology to bore holes through rock. I mean, it, oh dear. It's so tiresome to see the games being played and to recognize them for what they are. It's so tiresome. You cannot begin to understand how tiresome it is. Yeah, very good. <laughs> yep, I think you're on it. <laughs> okay, I must concentrate and try and get these images to you because it, re it really tells the, tells the story here. Um, so I'm, I've cleaned out everything I don't think I need. So there's only a few windows, really. Uh, quit that. I can quit that. <laughs> you know there's a lot of patents that are locked up there's also a lot of technology that's locked up and itty bitty little bits are creeping out because you can milk people you know you can milk them and you can milk them and you can milk them and you can milk them with just a little bit of a change it's just criminal it's just criminal oh 
dear. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can show this like this. Well, what happens if I shrink that? I'm not doing a very good job here. Right, so I do that. Oh, okay. Okay, this might work. So, let me see. Okay, it's not quite right. That's that's the directory I'm trying to show you. <laughs> yes! <laughs> okay, I think I can probably show you these things, right? <clears throat> okay. So, this is the uh, Lion Reactor. Um, uh, and what you see here is, uh, this is the Illumina tube. He put some silver over the end. The silver was over the end because uh, he wanted to maybe downsample any um, uh, X-ray or radiation that was coming out. So maybe it was to interact with that. Um, this is a copper winding, and this was the copper winding that was meant to just fill the gap between the, uh, uh, the, the this inner core and the quartz uh, reactor, uh, uh, the sort of heated tube. And so uh, the assembly, when it's, when it's on, would look something like this. And so that, that assembly would go into this effective tube furnace. And you can see the quartz here. This is the Cantal wire that's going around here. And this is the alumina. And the reactor, after it came out, looked like this. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> we know 100% certainly, one not guessing, not, not, not pretending. We know 100% certainly that this had exotic vacuum objects in there. And it came about by the discovery of this particular image here. Uh, maybe I can zoom that up. And the exotic vacuum object track was this area over here. Uh, and I can zoom into that, hopefully, with this image. And maybe I can... Is that going to let me go in there? Oh, yes. So you might know that my remote view uh, symbol is one of one of these track marks here. I think the one down here, this one, this one here. Uh, but this this is the track, um, and here's a different view on it. Uh, and this is one look at uh, exotic vacuum objects and how they move through the copper oxide here. And in, interestingly, look at look at the boundary here. Does does that remind you of anything? Does 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 this remind you of anything? Anyway, just just putting that out there. But anyway, <clears throat> um, uh, yes, that that David is the best st strange radiation track ever, <laughs> uh, and it it was recorded in Lion Two. This is Lion Four uh, in the copper oxide, and so at the actual place that it was recorded, uh, if I zoom in here. And maybe I can zoom in. Is it gonna? It it was actually just here, on this part of the reactor. And I would like to have a lot more time under an SEM and explore all the way around these crack lines uh, uh, to see if there are any other strange radiation tracks. Okay. So um, uh, this is a comparison between uh, a strange that strange radiation track and one that was caught in uh, uh, a, a webcam. The, this this webcam, in fact, this one here. <laughs> Uh, which was masked uh, with polytetrafluoroethylene tape uh, from uh, Echo Fuel. Uh, and so uh, that is the uh, Lion track. Okay, now that isn't the only thing that we found in there. We also found magnetic structures, as you can see here, with the, the north and the south, with this material that was ejected. There's a north and the south over here. Uh, there's another north and south. They're all over, and there's other cannons over here and so forth and and these are magnetic flux loops and so it's kind of like uh, you have one magnetic pole and another magnetic pole uh, uh, pseudo magnetic poles from these exotic vacuum objects and uh, they can build up and uh, yours they're, they're mirrored so here's some structures that are uh, mirrored 
and they, they don't really interact with each other when they're like this because they're very intense their, their field falls off in a uh, non-linear way and then you've got self-organized structures here so this is uh, a ring with two ring, 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 rings on it, which is pulling material in here, pulling material here, and this is probably going into the reactor, so it's actually pulling material into it. So Sorry, it's coming out of, so it's sucking material in the front, or, or one or the other, it's pulling in or out. <laughs> um, this is a three-way one uh, here, so you can see that the three tails on this. So this is like the plasmoids that Winston Bostick observed, uh, and uh, so, you know, the, 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 Basically, in the crust, so all, all of these uh, features were observed in the copper oxide in this area of, of the reactor. So that we, we know, as I was saying at the beginning of this video, that this copper basically aggregated the exotic vacuum objects. And then at some point, they started to get extremely aggressive. Now, uh, I can show how they uh, went on to form these structures and th these are kind of my idea of how the actual structures are in terms of a virtual sense you don't see them but uh, you've got north and south pseudo magnetic monopoles they are like primer fields except you've got all of the south facing in all the north facing in and the primer fields are effectively a logical extension of the boyd bushman patterns and you can see when you when you have two of the same coming together um, you actually have an interference area where the quartz, the fused quartz, is not affected, and you have particle flow that it's sweeping around. When you've got the other pole, it's like pushing material into the center, so you get a very, very white spot, but you still get the swept area around. Yeah, like like Lepont. Lepont Lepont's uh, primer bowls are effectively a ex logical extension of the, the Lockheed Martin patent by Boyd Bushman on his controllable uh, uh, um, uh, magnetic uh, uh, beam. Um, and that's the kind of device that we, you would use for tractoring and, and moving stuff around and manipulating things. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so what I've showed you there is uh, it, it's coming from inside the reactor. And in fact, inside the reactor, um, actually I, I probably should have done that first, uh, we have these uh, cookies. So these are cookies uh, uh, under the scanning electron microscope and these are diamonds in a nickel substrate. So you can see the carbon here uh, is uh, the red areas. Where it's black, it's just a shadow from the electron beam. And the nickel is green, so you can see that that is green. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the actual cookies. And then after the reaction has occurred, you can see many of the diamonds have disappeared, uh, but the nickel is mostly still in place. Um, so uh, then now the interesting thing is, is that you can see in this particular, this is a, a color microscopy, of, uh, of one of these positions uh, where the nickel held the diamond in place, but you've actually got the diamond converted into a tube. <laughs> and so what you had is you had your Taurus Evo. Uh, essentially, I, I, I shared uh, in Mining Diamonds with Lion and subsequent uh, presentations, uh, there were very, very small exotic vacuum objects mining and transmuting the material. But if they all uh, aggregate together into a Taurus, then the torus could then build up and build up in here and then it just flew off and what it did is you just ate the material uh, and in fact in other images I've showed how you can get a diamond which is kind of like um, uh, uh, it's like a glassy diamond if you know what I mean it's, it's very very weird material so here is the uh, outside of one of the lion reactors and this is very important because so what I've showed you is the inside core I've showed you that EVOs can eat away the diamond. The diamond is carbon-12, which is a boson. It's triple alpha. Uh, these, these exotic vacuum objects like to uh, chuck material into their cores, the ring or the center of the sphere, depending on whether it's a torus or a sphere. Uh, they, they like to uh, buy, uh, 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 put things in, in al alpha quanta. So triple alpha is beautiful in the film of carbon. It's good food stuff. So it's coming from the inside, working towards the outside. Um, and uh, uh, when it gets, it builds up in, in the copper, but then it turns the copper into a liquid, just as it was doing with the aluminium in John Hutchison samples. Then it gets to the point where it starts to eat through the material uh, in the quartz. So I'm just going to zoom through this because I can, I'm showing how it's assembled. So you can see the quartz here. Now this is the feature I'm showing you, which I, I'm really interested in here, uh, because this is uh, an exact replica 
of the uh, um, quantum coherent uh, magnetohydrodynamic uh, pair that was observed in uh, and drawn into the 1992 pattern application of, of Solin that was awarded for a quantum coherent uh, nuclear reactor. And this is actually able to deconstruct nucleons as well. Um, the, 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 it has force unification. So th this is the structure. So this is an example of uh, a macro evo pair boring through the quartz. And it's kind of caught in the act. And I've got some lovely macro photogra photography here, uh, which I can show you. So here's, here's the close up. So you can see what you have is you have uh, the two center points here and here, and they overlap, and the uh, the overlap is halfway between them. This is classic magnetohydrodynamics, um, and you've got the substructures, the, the 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 double vortices of the substructures. And if we if we look at this from, uh, I'm, I'll go in a closer look here, so you can really see the the vortice type substructures, and then the overall uh, pair here on the vortex pair. Um, I have another image somewhere which I want to share with you. Um, da, 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 da. Yes, um, th th these structures, Corky, work at every single scale, every single scale in the universe. And this was, uh, I think, the commentary, I think, in 1957 or 19, 1959 by Winston Bostick when he was creating what he called plasmoids using uh, ion-electron pair discharge units over a magnet. And they were self-organizing into these kind of structures. Um, but this is in uh, copper oxide, and it's like, <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's, it's set, in, set in the copper oxide. Um, so uh, I'm trying to find... Um, ah, so here we go. So on this one, you can see the hexagon structure here uh, of it, and you can also see the split lines here, which are at uh, 120 degrees. So you can really understand that th this is a very, very specific structure. And you can see on the, on the view from the outside, you can see that it is uh, uh, overlaying here. And that is the one on the right, which is effectively this viewed from the inside. And you can see it's overlaid. And, and the, the one on the, this one that's on the left, which is underneath, you can see that it's underneath on the inside. So this is a very large macro EVO that was born from trillions of EVOs in the core of the Lion reactor, worked its way, aggregated in the copper, and then started to eat through the quartz. And then uh, I've got some other rather rather beautiful imagery here. So uh, you, you can see in this case, it's a pole where it's pushing the material in the center. So you have a, uh, a white area in the center, whereas these ones here, it has a dark area. So it's, it's, it's not pushing material in, it's pulling material from the outside. So they're different poles that you're observing there. And um, it, it, I, I also showed in, in uh, John Hutchison's work that they, they scale and they aggregate together. So you have a 50 micron radius one here and they coalesce group together, <laughs> self-organize into a, a 200 micron radius one here and that they then go on to uh, group into what is a 1600 micron radius one here with the, the lower uh, scale here and it's always a D4D structure and this is the same structure that uh, was used by Tesla in his Tesla coils for, for the tori um, and it's a fundamental structure in nature and so why would it not make it um, so uh, I, I have something here um, and uh, this is a share slide that I shared during my Sochi presentation in 2018 and these are balls, and these balls are actually on the outside of the quartz uh, from the Lion 2 reactor, the same one I've been discussing. And the first of the three magnet, highly magnetic balls that are linked together are, is 50% inside the quartz. So when that reappeared in our 3D space, it kind of half was in, half out. And you will have seen this in Sapphire, where you have half of the sphere outside. And, and our, we've shown examples with Vega experiments where we've got them in that form. Eh? formation and also the full uh, uh, ball of fire as they're called in the 2001 fusion technology Japanese uh, uh, journal article balls of fire but they're, 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 they basically what this is in my view material that's effectively dumped out of uh, 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 an exotic vacuum object uh, in a sequence and they're highly magnetic and so this is from a crop circle and these are highly magnetic spheres basically the same equivalents to the, the ones that we've generated in the lab on this is supposedly 
from an ear of corn or something. That it, it's come from a crop circle, a genuine crop circle, not a fake crop circle. So if you are going to use this technology to lay down a crop circle, uh, the energy uh, that, that's driving the, the device uh, comes from uh, absorbing atoms from the air, let's say, and uh, the product are little ions, highly magnetic, magnetized spheres. Um, and, and so, you know, if, if you go to the Tunguska event, uh, uh, they found in the trees that were felled, uh, or I think even the remaining living trees, they found these same sort of uh, spheres inside the trees. Um, and so it was likely that that was uh, uh, maybe even a, an accident, a uh, natural event that occurred, or, or one that maybe even te Tesla induced through the planet, who knows. Um, uh, but uh, certainly uh, this thing has unimaginable power. Um, so so we, we've got to the quartz there. Then I wanted to show you uh, a little bit more detail. So what you're seeing on this one is this little group of three magnetic uh, spheres over here. This is the outside of the quartz. And what you're seeing here in these little features, this one is orthogonal to it and 50% the way through the surface. But the exotic vacuum object, I believe, was, or the monopole, was here. And there's another one here. And what happens is, it, it, is if you take fused quartz and you expose it to beta particles or x-rays and then you heat treat it to uh, at least something like, um, I think it's the 250 degrees centigrade, but um, ideally like 300 or 350 degrees centigrade, you will get all of the colors you see here. The greens, you will get see the, the, the dark black, you'll get the smoky quartz, you will get the yellow, you'll, you'll get all canary yellows and, and the white. Th these things are what you would get from an Evo throwing out um, beta particles and x-rays. So th this image for me was one of the most special images that I ever got of the Lion 2 uh, quartz reactor. And, and also, if I, if I zoom in here now, it's not maybe so clear, but um, and I want to re revisit this with better uh, camera. Um, but you can see the bore channels through here of the exotic vacuum objects at the boundary layer. So, that, so the, most of them are affecting this block down here, but it bores through here. And then you get your zigzag here with your strange radiation track over here. So um, uh, that's that. And so uh, now, this image tells you kind of what you need to know. You can make shields out of exotic vacuum objects. So this is the jewel. So this material has all been converted to what's called smoky quartz. So there was a very high flux of um, uh, beta particles and x-rays coming from the reactor. And we know this because we, well certainly we know there were x-rays because we exposed x-ray film uh, and in very focused beams as well. But this piece, which I called the jewel, is beautiful. Uh, firstly, it's got the rose quartz look here, which is another sort of x-ray exposed quartz. So some x-rays got through here, but it wasn't exposed in the same way here. And it looks like it has a kind of shield on it. And if you go under the microscope, you can see that this, this is the cut edge, like this cut edge here. You can see this is, the, in fact, it's this area here, uh, just somewhere here. Um, uh, this cut edge here, you have these counter-rotating vortices. And this is a self-organized arrangement of exotic vacuum objects, north and south pole, uh, arranged all over this. And, and this is exactly the same scale as those observed on the Hutchison fracture sample, which I have uh, here. Okay, so what you're looking at over on uh, this side is the Hutchison fracture sample. Now this is jiggling around on the surface. So if you were to interact one piece of aluminium with another, you could actually push them into each other. But if you imagine the, you, you suddenly um, got a piece of uh, iron, you had a large piece of this metal, and it had these exotic vacuum objects on the surface. What's going to happen when we put our iron on top of this is that iron is going to attract those, and it's going to become a skin on the iron. And then the skin will allow it, it to eat its way into the aluminium, as it's kind of like moving around. So it's, it's kind of like if you've got some... Uh, a, a, a silly putty and, and pushed a, a piece a wooden chopstick into it you kind of kind of imagine it like that but it's the actual exotic vacuum objects that are enabling the flux and so what I'm saying is that the copper in the lion reactor which we know 100% certainly had the vast quantities of exotic vacuum objects in there 
was able to then interact with the uh, quartz and the alumina, but because the iron uh, uh, or the cantal was a material that is less easily manipulated because it's magnetic uh, and it kind of stops on the boundary, um, if you don't push it too hard, um, uh, uh, the Cantal survived in that reactor, so uh, maybe I, I've got an image of that. I shared many images earlier. So, so it, here is an end on. So in this, you can see where it's got these round scalloped areas, and I imagine that there was a, a macro exotic vacuum object in here that was scooping out the aluminium, the alumina rather, from the core here. And you can see the Cantal is relatively untouched. It has a, a conglomeration of this geopolymer, as you might want to call it now, uh, aggregated onto it. Um, and, and that essentially is kind of that. So um, isotopic changes in the copper. I, I haven't looked, actually, uh, David. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and answer, see what questions people have. Um, OK, so oh, lots of things, seals. I like, uh, uh, so join the tech the magnetic beamer works because of what um, is moved by the so-called magnetic field and uh, it's, it's all the same thing the same thing that, that is causing these weird effects is the same thing that you are moving with that can you produce evos with a magnetic bowl set up um, you can certainly focus them uh, odd, odd 1x um, uh, and, and in fact, when when Lepont is is using a plasma, he will be creating macro evos in there. So he will be doing transmutation because it's able to focus um, the the uh, uh, the the coherent process. It's, to, it's able to assist it. Wouldn't providing proving the existence of a monopole pole itself be a breakthrough? Um, it's not actually a real monopole, although people argue that uh, um, neutrinos are effectively monopoles. It's been argued for a very, very long time. Um, and I think there's a paper even from this year, most recently, that is saying something along those lines. Um, but, you know, uh, Solin, I came to the conclusion, I, I published quite widely about it in, in the first half of last year. And then I, on the, I think it was the 18th of August, I came across the Solin pattern. And it wasn't just that he, can, he came to the same ultimate conclusions, that the monopoles could get to the, the pseudo monopoles could get to the strength of being able to uh, unify the forces, uh, which is able to basically transmute elements uh, um, without the complications of the Coulomb barrier and things like that. It's also able to deconstruct nucleons. So um, it's able to effectively turn matter into light and uh, electrons and things like that. And, and so, and, and, and uh, muons and muon uh, neutrinos and so on. It, it's, um, it, it's basically the most powerful thing there is. You can understand why they didn't want people to know about it, honestly. I mean, I said that in 2017, but, um, you know, they, they've weaponized it and there's so much good that can be done with it. It's just, it's just not fair that you have a few people that are like, oh, look at me, I can do this and you can't. Because <laughs> um, we'll only be subjugated with it. Um, I think that, it, uh, I think of the Evo chain as being dark in the middle and non-reactive at the ends. Um, at, at the end, uh, at the ends, you will have magnetic influence. Uh, and so I think uh, if you look at the presentation that I did, uh, Perov Zhichekev's work, it's, a, it's from a paper in 2012, I think, or 2011, where he used magnets and water and, and, and collected these things from the environment. He thought it was coming from the sun. But anyway, um, uh, he showed that on film, they can go through the film, but sometimes they snap and, and you end up with them attaching on one end magnetically and then they splay themselves out. Uh, he argued that quite well. So um, I think the presentation is, um, uh, what is it? It's uh, 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 Water of Life or something like that. Um, uh, I don't know Iggy Dirimple uh, about what you're referring to for 3D printing. 
uh, piezoelectricity in crystals ha ha has uh, can create exotic vacuum objects, and in fact, um, I I've argued that in quite some detail. If you go to uh, the MFMP Steam it, um, there is an article uh, uh, where I I've gone through uh, the Hestalin lights, and I argue that because of, and you find ball lightning in geological zones where there's a lot of copper, for instance, or, or other highly conductive metals, but you also get big changes uh, in temperature and also you you have uh, uh, quartz in the ground and so forth so um, these uh, quartz pr creates evos all the time i used to I, f I feel so sad because i used to mock people uh, you know about um well i didn't mock them I, ne I never mocked anyone but in my mind i was thinking i was thinking crystals are just a complete joke but they're not they're just not um Quartz is just amazing. In fact, I, I even I even had some image. This is an image. <laughs> it's just an amazing thing, quartz, uh, really. And it's it's made from the two most abundant elements in our crust. Um, if you go back and look at what I was uh, sharing earlier, it's like the vast majority of all of the mass of uh, the crust of the Earth is is quartz. Um, Okay. Ball lightning can come from underground. Yes. Thank you, Corky. Is there any side view of that surface so you could see the shape of the surface? Sorry, which which one are we talking about? Sakari Mova. Um uh, what is the size of that? Damn, I should have known what you what you were referring to at that time. I don't know. Um please go to the blog afterwards if there's specific questions you're going to uh, want to ask uh, I'm going to fill it out with the context of all of the material that I've been talking through in this presentation um, okay <laughs> no one talks about crop circle hard evidence no one uh, Uh, so certainly, I, I, I demonstrated using uh, the Parkamoff tables and the Lenner reaction calculator that I worked with um, uh, Philip Power in New Zealand. Um, it took me about 50 minutes, 50 seconds to prove the alchemists right. So the exact elements they chose, like um, quicksilver, that's mercury, um, uh, lead, and, uh, and bismuth, uh, they are the three elements that were available at the time um, uh, that when you put them with potassium or uh, calcium they produce them they are most likely to produce uh, gold <clears throat> but it's a resonant phenomenon you have to get that right white powder gold may be the perfect ev emitter same with other superconductors yeah yeah quite possibly and th there's some suggestion that that was in the ark of the covenant and uh, it, it's not that these things um the, the, uh, if you get it right, uh, I am of the understanding that uh, uh, if the material is imbued with uh, very strong exotic vacuum objects that are locked into the material, you can't get rid of them essentially, and, and, but they will also harness energy from the environment. So you literally end up with magic rocks or magic, magic metal things, but I mean, since rocks have a lot of metal in them, like <laughs> silicon and iron and so forth, semi-metals and, and iron and aluminium, then you can have magic rocks. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I would have thought I was nuts a few years ago. <laughs> my, my past self talking to my future self. Uh, yes, alchemy is from the old chemists. They created gold and did not mine it. Yeah, maybe uh, it's very possible. Uh, Tunguska was a highly charged asteroid. It may have been, but the the if it was, um, it would certainly have created vast quantities of exotic vacuum objects. It, uh, uh, when you, um, I will talk about this, but you need to go and look at the work of Messiaens. He actually discovered. Uh, uh, essentially the same thing as Ken Shoulders, but even before Ken Shoulders. Um, uh, and I will talk about <clears throat> how his work uh, really explains many of the different Lo Lohengy nuclear reaction methods. But 
essentially, if you have a, a columbic explosion, you will create exotic vacuum objects. So if you have a, an exploding, uh, because it's got so intense and energetic and, and you have sudden explosions, then you're going to get a lot of exotic vacuum objects made. Um, Uh, uh, yes, it can be a replicator. Um, I, I, I did discuss how um, uh, it, 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 this technology can do things that we probably shouldn't do. Um, yeah. Yes, Corky, it is all of the same thing. Um, Ken, Ken Shoulders only self-censored one of his publications and it was called disruptor.pdf and it was about you know like having devices that had a, a very small battery in them like as small as your phone and 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 the weapon would be an exotic vacuum object weapon and it's there's nothing that can stop it really um uh and and so this is why it's important that people know about this technology because um you can give you can as i said uh, to someone else very recently you can you can travel to any point in the planet basically nearly instantly you can walk through a wall um and then you could fire something at someone that would make no noise and it and they'd have terminal cancer in the following day you know you wouldn't know they'd had it but they'd be dead in a week or a couple of weeks um people really need and, and that's because you have potassium 40 in your body and you, you have carbon 14 in, in your sugar molecules that make up your dna so um uh, yeah um i'm hope i know i know you're looking at the number of people watching and stuff um i've kind of tried to play the, the rollout of this over the last uh well since the beginning of 2017 on a very low key because uh i had to make sure there was enough people in in the public uh that knew uh, enough uh to uh know that this is the way it is <laughs> you want a magic rock well uh uh, I think uh, John John's the guy that can make them right now. <laughs> uh, thank you, Julie we Welchel. Uh, um, so, what would it take concretely to make funding happen? Oh God, I don't know. But um, uh, I have a couple of plans this year. I've already talked about one um, for the last couple of years or certainly last year i've been interviewing john hutchison uh and uh um i he he's given me permission to work with him to produce uh, uh, an official biography it's going to be part biography telling parts of, the, of who he is and what and how he came to be and so forth uh, um in a um uh in a very honest way and then the second part will be um uh, uh, some actual analysis because he sent samples for free to many labs across the world and then he spent half of the last 30 years begging them and doing freedom of information acts and to try and get their analysis back so there was a lot of take 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 and, and not a lot of give back and so um, I'd like to do a, a very wide range of analysis and and, and put that out there because uh, they are incredibly interesting things um, uh, so uh, and so that I'm, I'm looking, planning to do that. Um, also, there's this thing that um, is, 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 in my view, a bit of a miracle. Um, just you, you need to, you, you need to hold, hold. I'm going to hold fire on that, um, but um, it is very, very, very special. Um, and so you will be hearing about that in the very near future. Um, so. God, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> you are a very fine minority. Yeah. Um, we we have had some people that have offered funding. Um, I'm going to make a call because we have 
we have, as far as I understand it, one of the only working genuine Yule Brown uh, 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 gas uh, uh, devices um, that is in a location in the US. And it looks like that that's going to work. So that I have a team. Hold on. Don't go away. <laughs> I think that was my better half telling me I should get home before I'm in big trouble. I've got to find my way home. Um, okay, so the single most important thing we can do is to get this tech into the hands of amateur experimenters. How do we do that safely? Yeah, um, well, this actual experiment here is pretty safe. I'm going to switch to it. A different camera. This is this is pretty safe. Uh, like I say, um, I wouldn't want to be near it when it's running. Um, but the experiment can take a couple of weeks. The preparation you need to bake the the uh, dye pads, the the nickel uh, uh, diamond uh, abrasive pads for a week or so. Uh, hold on. <laughs> yes, um, my wife is concerned that I'm going to get a hundred thousand pound, hundred thousand crown fine. Um, um, so uh, yeah, so this is the uh, uh, I think the easiest solution to do this um, in terms of exploring the technology and starting to understand it. Um, making a coherent wave, matter wave beam is is something different. Uh, a ball lightning gun I've already talked about. Uh, I've given drawings from the Electric spa Spacecraft Journal. If you look, Spacecraft Journal, if you look at um, the, uh, that was done by uh, John Hutchison, and uh, he, uh, that is in the uh, Steam It blog where I am talking about Hestalen uh, ball lightning. Okay, so the hutch is a is definitely a, a treasure. I, I, if it wasn't for John Hutchison, there would be no Ken Shoulders, which means we wouldn't know most of what we know about exotic vacuum objects, and I frankly would not have been able to recognise or get to the point of even looking for what I've observed in these various uh, technologies over the last several years. Thanks Brad, that's very kind of you. The wood woodpecker device is good for generating strange radiation. I, I think this is a much more interesting uh, reactor. This, like I say, this created pretty much all of the effects that Solin created in his quantum coherent reactor. Um, and so, uh, and th this is well described now. Um, and so I, I would like to run some experiments like this, um, maybe even this year, because um, uh, it's kind of affordable. Uh, hello, Bernard. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, so essentially uh, what I am saying is that uh, you can turn rock uh, to a liquid using these little things, uh, these uh, 
birdies as they call them in Russia um, uh, you have your uh, maybe I'm not showing the I'm not showing the image am I <laughs> um, so the, these uh, beautiful structures so uh, you have a, a sphere hole in the middle here you have some field effect is that pulling in whatever that is throwing something out there's a twist going on there um, thanks uh, through being on surfaces they can cause material to uh, jellyfy and allow you to pass some material through other materials uh, if you totally jellyfy something uh, at least al or along all of the crystal boundaries like you have here you may be able to push it in and mold it it's been shown to be able to mold um, and by using a conductive uh, flux which I believe you could add something like uh, um, uh, a, a mag magnetite uh, to say sand and uh, alumina and then you could make a geopolymer using that in this technology where the, the magnetite would be where the exotic vacuum objects focus and, and then they churn the other material uh, and then when the exotic vacuum objects dissipate through the aggregate uh, it then sets to what would look like a solid rock. Yes I'm gonna go home <laughs> Uh, anyway, thank you for your time. Um, uh, I will do a, a, an update uh, over the next couple of days to the blog uh, so that you can see uh, um, this in uh, more fidelity. Thank you very much. I will sign off now. And I will make a better presentation next time. <laughs>